from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, tensions still high on the Ukrainian border. We will look at how disinformation is sowing chaos and confusion about Russia's troop buildup on social media. Who is and isn't the aggressor on the digital front lines? Plus, the SEC kicks off its crypto crackdown. The crypto exchange BlockFi agrees to pay a $100 million fine over its lending tactics. CEO Zach Prince will be with us to talk about what's next. And sticking with crypto, Coinbase is back up and running after crashing amid record traffic on the back of its Super Bowl ad. What the crypto ad blitz means for the future of digital tokens. We'll get to all of that in a moment. But first, it's been a volatile day in the broader markets as the world watches the evolving standoff on the Ukrainian border. Our Ed Ludlow here with the latest. Ed, take it away. Yeah, look, U.S. equities swinging between losses and gains and losses. The S&P 500, of course, the main gauge of U.S. equities, made three attempts at a rally at a comeback out of negative territory. We closed down four-tenths of one percent. Technology shares, though, were able to snap the declines that we saw on Friday, which was a heavy loss in that session, but only just the Nasdaq 100 up just a tenth of one percent. Really mega caps leading the way here. You see the likes of Apple, Amazon, Tesla, NVIDIA, all big points movers to the upside, pushing up the NYSE Fan Plus index, and semiconductors also just eking out a game. But as you said, the, the, the market seemed to struggle getting a read on the situation with the Ukraine and Russian border. Of course, yields also higher as the market looks at the outlook for higher rates and the Federal Reserve minutes due this Wednesday. Interesting to look at Bitcoin as well in the cryptocurrency space. Of course, this weekend, Emily, everyone paying attention to the Super Bowl, but crypto does trade 24-7. And well, it tells the story, isn't it? We've kind of been trading sideways in a narrow range on Bitcoin, 42,000. We didn't see kind of big swings like we've done in previous risk off uh, sessions, really more static range. And speaking of Super Bowl, if you were busy this Sunday and you weren't paying attention to the markets, you might have missed this deal or rather the collapse of the deal. Let's take a look at Lockheed Martin and Aerodyne. The deal has been called off. Lockheed basically saying that they decided to pull the plug because the FTC sued to block the $4.4 billion deal. Remember, Lockheed wanted to do this deal to bring Aerojet's propulsion technology in-house. Why? To develop hypersonic weapons for the U.S. military. We don't really talk about the defense sector that much or that often in this show, but it was a sizable deal that's now been killed. And it does seem like the FTC is on a bit of a roll in terms of their antitrust work, because ultimately that's what this came down to. So if you were glued to your screen this weekend, you wouldn't have had much time to think about that one, Emily. All right, Ed, thank you. Well, the popular crypto platform BlockFi has agreed to pay $100 million to the SEC and 32 states over allegations it illegally offered a product that pays customers high interest rates to lend out their digital assets. Current BlockFi customers can continue to earn interest on their existing investments, but no new customers in the U.S. allowed. BlockFi says it plans to register a new crypto lending product that will satisfy the SEC's rules. Joining me now, Zach Prince, the CEO and co-founder of BlockFi. Zach, thank you so much for joining us. So why not register with the SEC a few years back? Yeah, hey, Emily, thanks for having me on. Um, so I wanted to give folks just a little bit of background before answering that question directly. BlockFi is a four and a half year old company based in the US with a team of over 850 people. We provide financial services to crypto market participants, including retail investors and institutional firms. On the retail side of our platform, we have more than a million clients and a suite of products that includes the interest account product, which is you know kind of in question with this settlement, uh, a credit card product with Bitcoin rewards, cryptocurrency trading, crypto-backed loans, a crypto wallet, and a personalized yield offering for high net worth individuals. Uh, on the institutional side of our platform, we operate BlockFi Prime, which provides bespoke lending and trade execution to more than 350 institutional firms. So the settlement today is related just to our interest account product, which is one of the most popular products we have because it offers folks a high yield on cryptocurrencies and stable coins at a time where inflation is running high and yield is hard to come by. Consumers around the globe have benefited tremendously from this product, which has paid out over 700 million in interest to BlockFi clients to date. And the fundamental so, question that prompted the right. settlement is whether or not it's a security. And our objective, Emily, was to find a path for us to keep offering this to as many clients as we possibly can. And we think that's what we've 
achieved here. And I don't know that it necessarily would have been an option, you know, when we launched the interest account uh, around three years ago in 2019. Okay, but we knew that the SEC was concerned about some of these lending products. We saw Coinbase cancel their lending product because of SEC scrutiny. So why not do this earlier? Yeah, why well, this now? issue, you know, we, we were working on, you know, regulatory questions, and we've always been heavily focused on, you know, compliance at BlockFi. We've paved the trail with other products like our crypto-backed loans in terms of finding regulatory, regulatory constructs that work for them. Um, this issue really came to a head for us about seven months ago. Um, and like I said, our focus was on protecting our clients' ability to, uh, to earn interest and finding a regulatory construct under which we could do that. So, you know, I'd highlight two key things from the settlement. One, it's an either admit nor deny settlement and that we cooperated with regulators throughout. And two, that the settlement very clearly lays out a path to registration of a crypto interest bearing security, which we believe will be a win not only for BlockFi, but also for the broader cryptocurrency industry because of the clarity that it brings. Now, SEC Commissioner Hester Pierce, who's known for being more crypto friendly, thought that this $100 million fine was disproportionate. She says rather than forcing transparency around retail crypto lending products, today's settlement may stop them from being offered to retail customers in the United States. What's your reaction to that? Well, look, I, I can't comment on uh, you know, anyone at the commission's specific statements or, or the commission's, you know, rationale behind the, the size of the, you know, settlement amount in terms of the fine. But I can say that BlockFi is in the fortunate financial position of being able to manage this settlement with zero impact to client funds and to continue investing and growing our team and platform. We have a ton of open roles that we're actively recruiting for. We have a lot of new product developments planned for later on this year on top of the two new products that we already launched so far this year and on top of the uh, Bitcoin Rewards credit card product, which we which we launched last summer. This S1 to register a new lending product, what will the new lending product look like? If the current product you feel is so successful, how will this be different? Uh, it, it'll be different in terms of, uh, you know, the type and frequency of reporting and information that's provided to consumers, you know, so BlockFi has uh, you know, tried to be a leader in uh, transparency and disclosures, which we've done through a, a variety of mechanisms since we launched the interest account. But by registering, we'll be, you know, participating in a, in a standard that, you know, folks are very familiar with. Uh, we'll be subjecting uh, ourselves to, you know, quarterly reporting of audited financials and other key metrics in terms of uh, what's happening on the platform and what risks exist within the product. And so, you know, it's really a it's really a change in terms of those disclosures, in terms of the structure, and in terms of the the regulatory clarity around you know what exactly is this product. And and in fact, I think that there will be some really interesting opportunities created for greater adoption of the product when it's you know officially defined and, and approved as a security. So, what is the signal to some of your competitors? I mean, do you expect folks like Coinbase will will follow suit here, given that clearly they wanted to have a lending product like this as well? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely blazing a, a path that, you know, I would fully expect others to follow. Uh, you know, ultimately, the cryptocurrency industry is, you know, still relatively early in its in its development, in my view. I think we have a long way to go and a lot of upside from here. And I think that competition uh, is great for consumers. Um, competition helps drive adoption. It helps, you know, it helps drive pricing uh, efficiencies. And, you know, we, we embrace and encourage competition. So uh, I think that we're blazing a path that, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say anyone in particular, but that, that hopefully quite a few folks will, will follow. I'm curious what you're hearing from customers. Are customers concerned, especially customers that have this lending product as it is? Well, well first, in, in terms of the customer impact, let's be clear about one thing. This settlement does not impact our existing clients' ability to earn interest. So for folks that have a BlockFi interest account, they will continue earning interest as they already as they always have. Uh, additionally, if you're someone that is thinking about becoming a new client of BlockFi, you can still access five out of the six retail-facing products on our platform. Trading, credit card, loans, BlockFi wallet, and personalized yield are all still available uh, to new clients. Um, okay. But, you know, our clients have been asking questions like, how long is the registration process going to take? Is this going to have an impact on the rates or the insurance? Um, and some of those things we can uh, talk about now. Others will, you know, come out in due course as we uh, proceed with uh, the steps in registration. So what's your message to new and prospective customers, you know, when clearly we're seeing regulation take some time to catch up to innovation, if that's what you want to call it, or new technology? And that leads to a lot of uncertainty 
you know, uh, ahead, whether it's this product or another. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the cryptocurrency, the industry writ large is at a stage today where it's becoming part of the national political dialogue. There's an increasing amount of work being done by regulators and the industry to help create clarity. Uh, you know, what I would say to consumers is that um, our view on this should be that we want the U.S. to be a leader in this exciting high growth technology sector. We want the largest companies built in this industry to be based here in the U.S. because it's great for our domestic economy and also helps promote our leadership and soft power across the globe, including the dollar standing as the global reserve currency. So you should understand these issues. You should educate yourself on what's happening in this market. Uh, and, and I would hope that you know a lot of folks, when we're going into midterm elections or you know just having conversations around the dinner table, uh, will help talk about these things in, a, in an educated uh, format. The fundamental objectives of the SEC around things like protecting investors and promoting capital markets are things that BlockFi is incredibly supportive of. Um, and this right. settlement for us is another example of us helping push forward the industry by working with regulators to help facilitate clarity. BlockFi CEO and co-founder Zach Prince, thank you for joining us. Coming up, how the conflict between Russia and Ukraine is playing out on social media with the Kremlin appearing to take on a new tactic. We'll tell you how. Next, this is Bloomberg. If we impose some very heavy sanctions, as I believe we're planning to do on the Russians uh, with regards to international banking, but most importantly, with regards to uh, Nord Stream 2 and uh, their ability to distribute fuel, uh, there's going to be some consequences to that uh, to the United States and to other countries as well. Former U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta there. And as the Russia-Ukraine standoff intensifies, state-run media and Kremlin officials are using another channel to justify a possible military offensive, social media. Joining me now to talk more about this is Nina Jankovic, global fellow at the Wilson Center and expert on disinformation and democratization. Nina, thank you so much for joining us. So I'd love it if you could take us to the digital front lines. What are you seeing there? How are pro-Russian actors using social media? versus Ukrainian ones? Well, I think this is an uh, exploration and expansion of the toolkit that we saw used in 2014, where uh, during the first invasion, the first Russian invasion of Ukraine, where Russia illegally annexed the Crimean Peninsula, we saw Russian actors using fake accounts, trolls and bots in order to spread pro-Kremlin messaging. We've moved on a little bit since then. Um, rather than those fake accounts, we're seeing trickle-down messages from Kremlin officials being cycled through state-run media and then laundered into the Western information ecosystem on the fringes of our political system to kind of give credence to Kremlin narratives. And what we're seeing are three main narratives. One, allegations that Ukraine is run by neo-Nazis. Now, it's important to note that while there are far-right forces in Ukraine, they do not hold any political power. They didn't even make it into parliament. Two, that NATO is actually the aggressor in this conflict, um, that it has nothing to do with the fact that Russia unilaterally stations over 125,000 troops on Ukraine's borders, and three, that U.S. energy and military lobbies are the ones that are pushing this conflict. Again, not the Kremlin, which is unilaterally uh, making these defensive hmm. uh, measures against Ukraine. So I think all of that is really important to note, and we're seeing this, again, laundered into the Western information ecosystem in order to have impact, and I have seen this impact myself as I've done my research on the far left and far right of the political spectrum, as well as policymakers. Right. So that was my next question. How much of an impact are these tactics having? Is it is it working? Essentially. Well, it's it's hard to tell, right? Because we we don't have a concurrent polling that's going on talking about have you seen Russian propaganda and if you saw Russian propaganda, what was re your reaction? I think a lot of people don't really know that what they're ingesting is a Russian narrative and don't know very much on about Ukraine and what's been going on there um, and the dem democratic path they've been treading for the past eight years. So we need some real education about that, and I think we've seen the United States try to do that through their declassification through 
through uh, toward deterrence strategy, which we've seen over the past couple of weeks. Um, but you know, it remains to be seen if if the ultimate goal is to convince the Russian government not to undertake this invasion. Um, we'll see in a matter of days or weeks, I think, whether this strategy has been successful. But ultimately, you know, I think a lot of Americans and Westerners in general think of Ukraine as someplace far away that they don't have to worry about. But um, as we heard Leon Panetta just saying, this conflict could have far-reaching consequences, not only for Russians, but for the price of oil, which we just saw shoot up today, thanks to uh, worries about the conflict escalating. We're seeing some sarcasm and subtlety in, in, in some of the media discourse coming out of Russia, and it's leading to quite obvious jumps in market moves. Investors are feeling pretty jumpy out there. I mean, talk to us about the real world consequences of some of these, you know, potentially very subtle digs. Well, you know, I think uh, we're seeing Russia push back on the White House and the United Kingdom's uh, kind of prognoses that an attack could be coming imminently, um, pushing back on the idea that, you know, their diplomats and staff aren't safe on the ground, that citizens aren't safe on the ground. But just as a reminder, whenever the Russian government uh, alleges that they're not about to do something in, in the recent uh, past, that's not been true. You know, they said they weren't involved in the annexation of Crimea. They were involved in the annexation of Crimea. They, they you know, laterally took the peninsula. They weren't involved in the shoot down of MH17. Um, they actually were. So I think we're seeing a lot of this back and forth. And because investors are smart and they know that, you know, the United States does depend on some Russian oil, that Europe depends on Russian gas and oil in order to, to fuel its heating during the winter, that things could get pretty ugly pretty quickly um, when these sanctions are imposed on Russia if they do decide to invade. And so I think that's why we're seeing that volatility in the markets. And there's, you you know the very real consequence of the fact that Ukraine is a large country. Um, if you if you aren't aware, I would suggest viewers look up a, a map of Ukraine superimposed on the map of Europe. It's huge, um, right. and it is right on the doorstep of Europe, and could have real consequences for migration and economics um, in the EU and and in its environs. So you know this war is not something that. Uh, would necessarily be kept to a small region. It would have far-reaching economic and humanitarian consequences for the continent, if not the whole world. You co-authored a report to verify photos and video footage appearing on social media out of presumably Russia. What platforms are you seeing most of this stuff happen on? Is it, is it TikTok? Is it Telegram? Is it Twitter still? And are platforms living up to their responsibility to moderate it? Yeah, so this report's actually really interesting. Through open source footage, we've been able to verify Russian troop movements coming from as far as the far east of Russia to Ukraine's borders. So this isn't disinformation. This is actually just normal Russian, Belarusian, and Crimean citizens uh, taking videos of tanks that they see rolling down their streets. And because of that, we're able to verify the types of equipment um, and units that are, are rolling into positions near the border. And that's really important as Russia continues to deny that this is anything uh, but, you know, normal troop exercises. Um, so that's the open source uh, component there. But we've also been tracking narratives on, on platforms like TikTok, Telegram, and Instagram, where a lot of the discourse um, related to Russian disinformation has moved since 2014. Before, we used to see stuff on message boards, on Facebook, on Twitter. Now we're seeing um, a lot more on these more youth-oriented platforms, more viral platforms, platforms that are driven by algorithms and, and by individual users' consumption, which makes it a lot more difficult to crack down on and, and a lot more difficult to make sure, okay, is this an authentic user or someone who is inauthentic and working on behalf of a government? It'll be interesting to see how that develops. All right, Nina Jankowicz, Global Fellow at the Wilson Center. Thank you so much. Lots to continue to monitor. Coming up, we're going to talk about the Crypto Bowl. How will the onslaught of Crypto Super Bowl ads impact mainstream adoption? Aside from crashing the Coinbase website, we'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. Coinbase has entered the big leagues. The crypto platform debuted a commercial during the Super Bowl, ditching the celebrity cameos and opting instead for a bouncing QR code for all 30 seconds that led to an offer of $15 in free Bitcoin for new users and a $3 million giveaway for a current one. 
For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Hannah Miller, who covers crypto for us. So $7 million for a 30-second slot. Did it work? I think it did. I mean, the evidence is in the fact that the website crashed right after this mm -hmm. QR code came up and people were scanning it nonstop. Uh, so I think it's really exciting to see. It was definitely a unique way of approaching a Super Bowl ad. And, you know, they didn't go with celebrity star power. Coinbase and FTX did these crypto giveaways. FTX did go for the celebrity cameo with, with Larry David and a couple of others. Is a giveaway, does a giveaway work or is it gimm gimmicky? I think it is a bit gimmicky, but this is a way to show people, you know, hey, crypto's fun, uh, you know, jump right on in. Uh, but I think it is interesting in that it shows that a lot of success in crypto boils down to chance. So it's sort of a, you know, unique approach here. And I think it's interesting that they kind of both went with this uh, giveaway tactic. I think a lot of folks could probably relate to Larry David's skepticism. And I'm wondering if this will really drive mainstream adoption. Do you think we're going to, when we look back on the crypto bowl in history, will we see a bump in crypto ownership? I mean, it very well could be. I think, you know, Larry David's skepticism probably struck a chord with people who are maybe a bit daunted by crypto. Um, and he's such a familiar face that I think it could at least intrigue people about crypto. Um, and we've already seen, you know, app downloads increase for Coinbase's app. And there is evidence that this seems to have caught on and that there is positive buzz uh, about LeBron this app. LeBron also made it into a crypto ad to a slightly better reception than Matt Damon. Um, do we think, I mean, obviously, we're going to see more intersection of sports and crypto in the future. What are you expecting to see? Yeah, definitely more partnerships uh, between you know, different sports leagues and crypto companies. We've already seen this happen with FTX uh, and Coinbase striking partnerships with the NBA. Um, FTX also has an, a partnership with MLB umpires at baseball games wear an FTX logo um, on their uniforms. And I think this is just the, the start of more mainstream traction for crypto. And sports is an easy way uh, for people to get involved and hear about it. All right, we'll see how many newbies buy the dip. If it is indeed a dip, Bloomberg's Hannah Miller, who covers crypto for us. Thank you, Hannah. Coming up, Kraken CEO Jesse Powell joins us to share his reaction to the Super Bowl crypto ad takeover and why he didn't jump on the bandwagon. That's later in the show. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get back to the markets in one of Monday's best performers with our Ed Ludlow. Ed, Rivian on the move. Why? Em, it's one of your favorite days of the year. Love is in the air, sometimes <laughs> heartbreak. Can that's you tell right, I'm Emily. dressed up for the occasion? Well, that's right, Emily. It is, of course, 13F filing day, the one we've all been waiting for. It's the day, <laughs> the deadline, really. The SEC requires all hedge funds to state what their U.S. equity investments were as of the close of the fourth quarter. And Rivian was... They were in love with Rivian in this past quarter, even though the stock was under pressure. Let's bring up some of the names. Some of these were existing investors, right, that bought in at the IPO. There were private round investors previous to that. You've got Soros adding to their stake. D1 Capital Partners adding to the stake. T. Rowe Price, which is the largest single shareholder, adding to its stake. And then Tiger Global disclosing a new stake, although that's based on the fact we're not sure if they participated in private rounds. Let's bring up the stock performance. Year to date, this is a stock that's down more than 30%. And it is down 20 20% since that IPO. There's been a lot of concern about their ramp up of production. Doesn't matter. In the fourth quarter, even though the stock was on a downward trajectory, you see there at the end of 2021, a lot of these big, big names coming in and adding to their position, which should be positive, and it was so for the stock on Monday. Again, real interest from these hedge funds and fund managers in the tech sector broadly, but another big one that jumped out at me, Berkshire and Activision. Really interesting. Activ Berkshire, of course, Warren Buffett's firm adding 14.7 million shares, a stake that would have been valued at $975 million on December 31st. Here's the thing, Emily. December 31st 
we had not yet had the deal of Microsoft acquiring Activision for 69 billion mm. US dollars. So this was pre-metaverse. This was pre-metaverse discussion and pre-metaverse play. Maybe some interesting foresight from Buffett. He knows Microsoft real well. Uh, the Oracle of Omaha. Maybe yeah. he strikes again. All right. Thank you, Ed. Well, metaverse might be the buzzword of the year so far, but close behind it is DeFi or decentralized finance, an umbrella term for peer-to-peer -peer financial services on blockchains. There's a ton of activity and VC money pouring into it, while scams and thefts still plague the space. Joining us now with some ideas, A Crew Capital founding partner, Lauren Kolodny. Lauren, great to have you with us. There's so much money flowing into DeFi and Web3 right now. Where is the smart money going? Thanks for having me, Emily. Yeah, look, uh, no question, lots of buzz around this space right now, but I think this year uh, in DeFi, we're seeing a real convergence between fintech, CFI, and DeFi. And what I mean by this is it's really coming from all angles. So on the fintech side, we've been an investor in fintech for the last decade in companies like Chime and Gusto and DiviPay, and we're seeing a lot of traditional fintech companies look to adopt crypto and DeFi strategies. Um, they're doing that by engaging with infrastructure that's enabling it. New companies like Conduit are helping to enable this. Uh, companies like Compound Treasury are, are enabling this too. So we're looking at infrastructure plays that are really helping to bring fintech into crypto. And on the other side of things, in DeFi, we think DeFi is starting to really need to learn lessons uh, that fintech has really learned over the last decade around uh, consumer productization. When you think about how hard it is for your average consumer or user to engage with DeFi right now, it's it's no small feat. So Emily, I don't know if you've done it yourself, but it's one of these things where if, if you want to participate in DeFi, you essentially have to go onto an exchange like a Coinbase, buy Ethereum probably, then move that Ethereum to a wallet like a MetaMask, exchange it on a decentralized exchange for a more local currency, so using like a Uniswap, and then you can start, just start to engage in DeFi. So the onboarding experience is really cumbersome. And so we're starting to see DeFi projects that are really adopting better consumer and user interfaces to, to enable that. Um, on the institutional side, there's a company we invested in actually called Avant Garde, founded by Mona Elisa, which is a, a female founder, which is uh, unfortunately refreshing in this space. Um, right. Uh, but that's just one example. What about the not so smart money? What's overhyped, overblown? You know, I think that uh, we're just, there's just such a proliferation of projects, right? And there are people coming out of the woodwork, starting things that, are risky for consumers. Um, flash loans being one example uh, that is uh, seeing a lot of activity, but but really risky. Um, I think also uh, there's a lot of activity going on around cross-chain technologies, which really enable interoperability across various level one protocols. Um, and uh, and we need that interoperability, but uh, but the sophistication is not yet there. Um, you know, we recently saw a big attack on Wormhole, which is one of the more popular chains between um, uh, the L1s, Ethereum, and Solana. And so I just think that the market is nascent and we have to be very careful uh, about some of these new technologies. Now, we hear so much about DeFi and the potential to remove these middlemen, democratize finance, and yet DeFi is still really hard to access for the average person. Have you found the company that can do DeFi for the masses like Netflix and AOL did for the internet? To be quite candid, we're in early days. So I think it's starting more on the institutional side, like I mentioned with avant-garde, and I think we're starting to see it more and more in consumer. I mean, I, I still think we're, we're, uh, we're looking to the future, and this is why this is the category that we're so excited to invest in in, uh, in this calendar year, both, as I said, on net new companies offering new consumer products and on the infrastructure players that are really enabling existing fintechs that have the attention of mainstream consumers to start to offer higher yield uh, products to their customers. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, I do think that DeFi has the potential to really democratize access. Um, but it's a technology like anything else. And at the end of the day, it, it, it's designed by the people that are involved and um, the good and bad will come from those operators. All right, so the next 100 million users, is that like a decade out, a year out? When does that happen? 
I, I think we'll see it in this in this calendar year. Um, I think that a lot of what I'm describing, the infrastructure is being developed so quickly. Uh, we're seeing you know all kinds of new companies pop up that are really offering um, these new user interfaces. Um, gamification education is really starting to take off. So you can look at what Coinbase has done with Coinbase Learn as one example, um, where we're really pleased to be uh, an earlier investor. Um, or uh, new companies like Rabbit Hole, um, which connects into your MetaMask or existing wallet and helps you guide consumers through the experience of how to right. really use DeFi. Um, these, are, these are projects that are really uh, enabling new users to come on. Um, so I think it's Lauren, I think it's here. Lauren Kaladny, founding partner at A Crew Capital. Thanks for giving us your view of the future. Thanks. Meantime, some news crossing in the chip industry. Bloomberg has learned Intel close to a deal to acquire Tower Semiconductor for about five billion dollars as part of its push into the outsourced chip manufacturing business. This according to a person familiar with the negotiations. Intel said to plan to announce the purchase of this Israeli company as early as Tuesday morning. Coming up, the crypto bowl. Kraken was one of the few crypto exchanges that didn't pay $7 million for a 30-second Super Bowl spot. Why not? Kraken CEO Jesse Powell with us next. This is Bloomberg. We saw cryptocurrency firms went uh, big on one of the most watched media events of the year, booking coveted commercial time for a captive audience in what many have dubbed the Crypto Bowl. Coinbase spent millions on an ad with just a single QR code. Later, their website crashed. Bloomberg Shanali Bostic joins me now for our crypto report. Shanali, I got to say I was one of the people who clicked on the QR code and went <laughs> to the Coinbase the website. So it worked with me and here we are talking about it. But is that success or not? Yeah, well, it's interesting to think about what happened there. You have the chief product officer over at Coinbase saying that they had the most traffic that they ever had. And you're seeing it in the numbers when it comes to Coinbase. They are rising. They have risen very far up in the App Store for Apple, up to number two. In fact, Emily, you can't see another crypto company, another crypto exchange in the top five, let alone the top 10 or the top 20 if you don't cash the, count the cash app for the Apple App Store. So in that way, it is a success. But with all of that said, you are not seeing a surge in Bitcoin prices that go along with all of these new potential users. You have Coinbase giving away $15 to new users, millions to existing customers as gratitude, but Bitcoin prices itself as a result of all of these promotions plus these other exchanges has not risen even $1,000 over the last couple of days, even with a little bit of a decline the last couple of days. So what does this all mean at the end? What does it mean for these companies? These customer acquisition costs moving forward might get difficult. And if you look at companies like Coinbase, like SoFi even, that hosted the Super Bowl, now trading stocks, now trading crypto, along with eToro as well, SoFi and Coinbase are actually down more than 20% on the year when you look at their stocks in U.S. trading. So it will be interesting to see whether this translates into a business model, let alone just a popularity online. All right, Shanali, hang with us. I want to dig into this crypto ad takeover and the merits of it or not with Kraken CEO Jesse Powell. Kraken skipped the crypto ad bonanza on Sunday. Jesse, great to have you back with us. So why didn't you do a Super Bowl ad? I mean, everyone else did. Um, you know, sometimes it's nice to be second and, and, and see what happens to all the guys who want to run out there first. You know, I think the um, the customer acquisition costs that some of these guys are paying, um, you know, buying these stadiums, uh, buying these sports teams. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical that this is going to play out in the long term um, as, a, as a positive investment. You know, I think this is really a marathon. I don't think, you know, I think at any given time, there are only so many people interested in coming into the crypto space. And I think, you know, spending thousands of dollars for, for per user acquisition um, is definitely not going to be sustainable. So, um, you know, we don't have to be first at, at everything. You know, we just kind of we want to be best, the best at what we do, and we want to have you know a long-term sustainable business. It's not just about making a flash in the pan, um, you know, for our investors, for employees. Uh, you know, we're we're here running a business, not a popularity contest. But is this a good strategy for the overall crypto space? Do you think this will bring in a lot of new owners, or does it just oversaturate, overhype things? 
It's a great question, you know, and, and I think it'll be great to see. Maybe we'll find out in the um, in the public reports uh, from Coinbase, you know, what what this proved out to do for them. Was it more than just getting a bunch of visitors to your website? Um, did it did it actually translate into uh, revenue at the end of the day? Um, you know, I think that's yet to be seen, and we'll be watching closely, and, and hopefully, we'll get some some indication as to whether these campaigns were successful. Jesse, I'm really curious about the winning strategy here because you're seeing firms like FTX that expand further into the stock market in addition to crypto. You see firms like them and others look to provide more, and Coinbase really provide more access to institutional investors where the ticket size is so much bigger than the retail investor in a purchase of any Bitcoin. So for you, what is the way to go in terms of building a bigger business? We're really focused on the consumer segment right now. You know, historically, uh, the company is almost 11 years old now, um, but we were historically focused on the institutional segment, on the professional trader segment, and only in the last year have we started to focus on consumer. And yes, the check sizes are bigger for institutions. Uh, however, they're also much more price sensitive. You know, they're sensitive to the fees. So, and there are fewer of them. So, I don't think that you necessarily get to a bigger business. Um, just by serving that demographic, you know, if you just look at um, the valuation of a PayPal versus CME Group or a Nasdaq, you know, PayPal has, has is multiple times bigger than those, and it's because of the consumer focus and the global focus. And so, um, you know, that's the direction we're headed. I think there's a bigger business there. Um, there's more room for for a brand identity there and brand loyalty, and um, I think the focus on institutional, while it might seem attractive in the short term, I think. There's a cap to that business, and I think that those those um, clients are not necessarily loyal. You know, they might be loyal to to where they get the lowest fees, uh, and and the lowest fees, you know, are are your revenue. So, um, from a business perspective, you know, I think it makes sense, at least for us, to focus more on the consumer business. While we still continue to serve the in, uh, institutional business, um, our focus, you know, and that's where our roots are. But our focus today is on consumer. Curious what your thoughts are on this BlockFi $100 million penalty and how it's impacting your regulatory approach. I know you recently tweeted that you're hiring 30 lawyers who are probably going to be pretty busy. Yeah, absolutely. And Marco said, you know, we would hire up to 60. Uh, you know, it's a great time to be a lawyer. Um, the, the crypto industry broadly you know, has a lot of unanswered questions. And um, I think that'll continue to be the case for a long time as, as things shape up globally. Um, in terms of our business, you know, we have a banking license in Wyoming, um, so you know we, we might have a bit of a different um, approach to to the lending business in the future. But um, you know, I think it it kind of confirms kind of the the suspicions that we've had all, all along about this model um, is that you know we're, we weren't totally sure that this was going to survive regulatory scrutiny, and it sounds like it hasn't in the United States, uh, which is one of the reasons why we pursued the banking license in the first place, which we feel like would allow us to do um, some of these things that maybe BlockFi is not able to do now in the United States with uh, cons consumers. You know, I'm curious, there's what you do with regulators and there's what you do on your own and in an independent audit, the idea of proof of reserves. How does this start to change the landscape for consumers and consumer protection? And what is it really doing uh, to prove what's there for the underlying assets? Yeah, so we recently completed a proof of reserves audit. It's the second in our company's history. We pioneered this process about seven years ago uh, when we did the first one in the industry. And since then, there have been other companies that have done it, but we're, we're by far the largest venue to have done this in recent history. And what it does is allows the users to, to confirm for themselves through cryptography that we actually control the coins that that we say we do, you know, that we hold for them, that, that you know, they can prove cryptographically that in a quote unquote like bank run type scenario, you know, where if everyone came for their withdrawals at the same time, that we would be able to serve those withdrawals. Um, so, you know, I think we've seen over over history, there's been tens of billions of dollars of funds stolen or lost or misappropriated um, somehow in the crypto space. And, you know, this is something that's just unprecedented in traditional finance. You don't have this level of transparency. Uh, the regulators aren't even mandating this stuff of banks. You know, you never know if you go to the bank, if they're going to be able to process your withdrawal or not. You know, I've, I've had uh, experiences myself where I go to the bank and ask for some amount of cash and they say, well, you're going to have to come back in a few days because we don't have that cash. So, 
you know, this is something that that is above and beyond what any traditional financial institution can offer. And it's something that the crypto industry is doing for itself. And I, I think it sets a great example for the world and for regulators and for law enforcement who are worried about uh, these situations of, of insolvency that um, this industry can control for these things and it can self-regulate. And um, this sets a new bar, I hope, that you know, regulators will start to look at and, and start to apply you know, the, the scrutiny that they have of the crypto industry back on the traditional finance industry, which is not offering these kinds of tools or transparency. I noticed, Jesse, that you are promoting crypto for Valentine's Day, and I'm curious why you think that's a way to show your loved one that you care, given the volatility of the market. I mean, can we really count on Bitcoin right now, especially where it's at in the moment? Look, I think diamonds are just losing value every day. So, you know, you're, you're, you would be much better off giving your partner some Bitcoin today and having them hold on to that for the for the next 20 years, then you would be giving them a diamond, you know, which are being created in labs these days. Uh, that cannot happen with Bitcoin. You know, there's a finite supply. Um, you know, I'm very bullish on the currency long term and the prospects uh, of the entire industry. So, you know, I think it's a fantastic gift. It brings someone into the space. And, um, you know, Bitcoin is more is more than price speculation. It's solving real world problems, you know, like we're seeing in Canada where you have um, fundraisers being shut down by the government or be, by centralized um, fundraising platforms. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin is is circumventing that and getting around that and getting money directly to the people. So, you know, I think it's a vote for freedom and um, it's a representation of true love if you give yeah. someone Bitcoin. Jesse, well, you know, I know I, beyond what it means, I am curious about the price here because anybody who loved Bitcoin last year at 60,000 or so uh, was still thinking it could possibly get to 100K. I know you thought so at one point too. How fast do we get there again? For sure, I've for still got my Lambo time, yeah. reservation uh, on hold. <laughs> um, hoping to get one with air conditioning. Uh, so, you know, I think I'm still bullish on the price. You know, I, I think, yeah, a lot of us thought that, that we were going to get over $100,000 last year. Um, but, you know, you can't predict these things. Ultimately, you know, what we see are continuing use cases and continuing reasons for people to use Bitcoin. I mean, inflation is at an all time high since the 80s. And uh, that's the stated inflation. We all know when we go to the supermarket that inflation is way beyond seven and a half percent. So, uh, you know, that combined with with the the controls, um, the clampdown on these uh, protests and and legitimate fundraising efforts, um, I think shows that the use case for Bitcoin is getting stronger and stronger. And uh, there's just more and more reason to believe in it long term. All right, Bitcoin diamonds, tough call. Luckily, people have choices all. out there. Kraken CEO. <laughs> Put a Bitcoin on it. That's what I'd say. <laughs> Kraken CEO Jesse Powell and our very own Shanali Basik. Thank you both. Coming up from Meta to Microsoft, we'll take you through today's top tech stories next. This is Bloomberg. Well, first it was finance and now it's technology. The return to the office underway for Microsoft as COVID cases decline across the country. The company telling its U.S. employees to start returning at the end of the month in a fresh attempt to get the tech giant's operations back to normal. Microsoft's chief marketing officer writing in a blog post that workers should begin a 30-day transition period starting at the beginning of March. That said, the company still plans to allow remote work for up to half the week without a manager's approval. And sticking with Tech Meta, facing a fresh lawsuit in Texas. The state's attorney general filing a suit against the parent company of Facebook over use of its now discontinued facial recognition technology. The state alleging that use of that tech violated its privacy protections for personal biometric data. The lawsuit seeking civil penalties in the hundreds of billions of dollars, according to a person familiar with the matter. Meta says these claims are without merit and that we will defend, they will defend themselves, quote, vigorously. And staying in the Lone Star State, the FAA is extending SpaceX's Texas Environmental Review for its Starship rocket until late March. It is the second delay of the review that will assess the impact of launch operations in Boca Chica, Texas. It's now expected to finish March 28th, but SpaceX must also obtain a license for a test flight and others it conducts from Texas.
That's it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tomorrow we've got Brian Chesky right here on Bloomberg Television on the back of Airbnb results. This is Bloomberg.